Welcome to the PCR TV 2019. I'm Giulio Guagliumi from Ospedale Papa Giovanni di Bergamo, and I'm pleased to have with me Tom Johnson from the Bristol Heart Institute, UK. Tom, we are going to discuss about uh, one imaging document, and especially one intracoronary imaging document you presented at the Euro PCR 2019. Tell us why an additional document on use of intracoronary imaging. So thanks, Julia. So the, the document is an incredibly important uh, part of the guideline or consensus uh, provided by the European Association for PCI and really acknowledges the difficulties that uh, I think we as an interventional community have in understanding how best to apply this very exciting technology uh, to ensure the best possible outcomes for our patients. And I think that's reflected nicely within actually the construct of both the first part and the mo more recent second part of the consensus, which has been created by an expert group, which is a global community. So we have predominantly members from Europe, but also expertise from the United States of America, from China, from Japan. So why that? Why to get uh, experts from the global world instead of to stay in uh, Europe? Well, I think it reflects the fact that there is a huge amount of variability in terms of use of the technology. So we have in Japan a, a use of up to 80% of imaging guided intervention, and yet in Europe probably only 5 to 10%. And clearly that, that asks the question, why such a great difference? How should we be applying this, this technology? And the purpose of the documents was to try and establish for the community a better understanding of where we believe it has great strength. So the documents was essentially focused on clinical use and which type of data we had on background. It was only scientific, we look to something that it was more practical. Tell us something. So uh, the emphasis certainly was on practical uh, guideline, practical consensus statements for the clinician user. And we have to acknowledge it spans from best practice to evidence base. Now, the fact was that the document originally was going to be a single document published in both European Heart and Euro Intervention. But it, we have so much to discuss that in fact it's now spanned two years with publication last year of the first part focusing predominantly on uh, stent optimization, achieving the best possible result at the point of intervention and also looking at stent failure. But this second part has then focused on areas perhaps with less evidence base. Okay, but tell us which type of area are the most urgent to be filled in terms of a practical suggestion to the interventional cardiologist. So this second part document has got three broad themes and the, the first theme being uh, acute coronary syndrome and the role of intracoronary imaging in understanding and really guiding decision making in acute coronary syndrome. The second theme was looking really at the idea of characterizing a patient's risk, understanding areas of vulnerability. And the third part was really then establishing more clearly from the recent European Society guideline on the use of intravascular ultrasound in assessing hemodynamic significance of lesions. So three broad themes. Okay, let's go back and dissect uh, the major topics. So we are dealing with uh, ACS patients every day, many of them. So what uh, intracoronary imaging can bring in addition to what we can have uh, by uh, Andrew? In which patients uh, to do what, uh, which type of decision-making process? So I mean, that's an incredibly broad topic to cover. And, and one of the things we've attempted to establish is an algorithm or an understanding for the clinician user as to where intracoronary imaging may play a role. And so we're faced both with uh, atypical presentation, but maybe also atypical patients in terms of risk profiling. And I think probably the, the most useful element within the true atherosclerotic ACS cohort would be where we're faced with non-obstructive or maybe ambiguous angiography. So in the sense of maybe multiple culprits, or haziness, or just an un unclear or identifiable uh, culprit. Which are the major points uh, that uh, 
we may use uh, in practice uh, through the imaging assessment of the vessel to decide, uh, for instance, which is uh, the culprit lesion. So within our statement, we've clearly identified that imaging plays a role in, in clearly uh, delineating the, the culprit lesion, and I guess most importantly, identification of thrombus. And we have been very clear that OCT is really the gold standard for identifying uh, that, that particular component of an acute coronary event. So Tom, uh, give us uh, some idea about uh, how frequently, for instance, in the growing part uh, of the NST ACS uh, could be to have incertainness in identifying the culprit, in having multi-culprit lesion, how much is it frequent? So it, it has been reported as high as 30% of our angiograms in patients presenting with non-ST elevation ACS. And often we can be faced certainly up to 10% in a place where patients may have multiple culprits or certainly multiple stenoses, but an inability to truly define which territory was the cause for concern. So quite common. And uh, so we state uh, something about uh, how to identify. And uh, there is anything uh, new about uh, the plaque identification, the type of plaque. For instance, that there are uh, people coming with uh, something different uh, that we can catch by using intracoronary imaging. Yeah, for sure. So clearly, uh, plaque rupture is by far and away the commonest presentation of an acute coronary event. But actually, over the last couple of years, there's been a huge amount of uh, excitement and, and noise about plaque erosion, uh, primarily through a single study from China, uh, the erosion study for which we had one of the authors involved in the uh, document. But it, that suggests that maybe in the presence of non-obstructive disease and simply evidence of erosion of the lumen with adherence of thrombus, that there may be the ability to treat conservatively. Now that's hypothesis generating at the present, but absolutely we acknowledge within our algorithm that imaging may play a role in the future in avoiding intervention in a, in a certain cohort of individuals. So Tom, you was advisor that there, there are new entities uh, uh, in the plaque uh, characteristic that uh, we can see with acute coronary syndrome, like uh, this eruptive cancer fine nodule. What is an eruptive cancer fine nodule and which type of problems is making to the interventional cardiologist? So eruptive calcified nodule was probably one of the hotly, most hotly debated elements of this consensus document. Um, we were very clear we wanted to retain actually that original descriptor that was used by Renu Vimani in the sudden death cohort back in 2000, but it does beautifully illustrate the entity of uh, uh, a breach in the lumen with, again, potential adherence of thrombus indicating an acute event, but underlying which is uh, a nodule of calcium. Now, calcium, I think, is probably one of the most exciting elements that we need to focus upon with imaging. Because exciting and scary because uh, sometimes if you wanted to expand, we are going to have an additional resistance, and that could be the problem with the calcifying nodule. For sure scary, but I think acknowledging that there's every hope that imaging both will delineate calcium, but also provide for us the ability to modify a plaque prior to stent deployment. And I think the most important message comes that if we're going to adopt an imaging strategy, we adopt it from the very beginning of a procedure, ensuring then that we've understood what we are or are not treating beyond that modification prior to the implantation of a stent and then ensuring as per the guidance from the first document that we've adequately optimized the stent before sending our patient on their way. So this document is bringing to the surface the value of the pre-interventional imaging assessment for decision making. What about ambiguities? Many times we are facing two problems involving the osteo left main or involving aneurysmatic segment of the vessel. Uh, there, is, uh, there was any type of statement regarding this aspect? Yes, yeah, so that's another important area that we've addressed within the document and, and clearly acknowledging again this, this flaw in our interpretation of angiography. And there are certainly uh, particular populations that we struggle with most and aortal osteal disease particularly due to the eccentric takeoff of the vessel often due to also uh, kind of clear association with calcification in those in those lesion areas we've addressed actually within the manuscript some very beautiful images and, and one of actually a, an aorta osteal compression 
caused extrinsically, which again can only really be then truly uh, understood by imaging um, non-invasive or invasive. Um, but clearly that offers for us the ability to understand what we're faced with prior to considering the most appropriate treatment strategy. Okay, two last uh, remaining questions. The first one is, uh, where is this, uh, this uh, manuscript? Uh, is already available for uh, the interventional cardiologist? Yeah, so it's important to acknowledge that we have achieved fast track simultaneous publication with uh, presentation here at EuroPCR 2019. Another element I think it's really important to stress again in terms of that global enterprise is the endorsement we've had from uh, three societies, in fact the Chinese uh, Cardiac Society from the Society um, of the New Zealand and Australia and then also from Hong Kong uh, Stent, the okay. Hong Kong Society. The, the last remaining question is uh, key messages. We wanted to leave uh, this uh, short interview with the uh, key messages. Uh, who should be imaged? Uh, in uh, this uh, different setting, so <clears throat> and uh, the importance, uh, something that you wanted to recommend uh, to be sure that uh, uh, the uh, interventional cardiologists are understanding and eventually are using on the table. So I think I think as I've already emphasised, in terms of uh, really bringing together both the first part and the second part of the document, is this need to consider imaging from the very beginning to the very end of a procedure but clearly the emphasis at present is on acknowledging that our interpretation of the angiogram can be challenging. In the ACS setting, I think there's absolutely a need where we're faced with ambiguity of multiple culprit or um, no clear identifiable culprit, particularly in those that may be non-atherosclerotic presentation. And then beyond that, it's in terms of establishing a, a better understanding of uh, angiographic ambiguity in the stable setting We've mentioned um, aortoosteal characteristics, aneurysm, ectatic disease. So a lot of stuff in the first documents, we claim that the complex patient and lesion might need to be investigated with intracoronary imaging. Now we are heading the value of subcategories of ACS and some uh, angiographic ambiguities. Thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations for this uh, very nice achievement. Thanks, Julia.